Tony Burke, welcome to the program. Happy Father's Day, Dad. And to you, and to you and all the dads. Uh, look, there are several parts of the legislation you're going to introduce tomorrow on workplace reform. Let's start with criminalising wage theft, the, the tougher penalties that are being talked about in the papers this morning. How would deliberate um, underpayment of workers be determined as opposed to accidental underpayment? Same way the courts always deal with intention. Yeah, at the moment, if you intentionally as a worker take money from the till, it's a criminal offence, and it should be. Yeah. But if the employer intentionally withholds money from your pay, it's not a criminal offence. Now, the, that's a simple loophole, should be logically simple to close. I'm surprised it's even been controversial. Yeah. Uh, you know, the objective here is not to send people to jail. The objective is to make sure that people are paid properly. And so there's a combination of the changes we're making with the prison terms, being there, which I do think will sharpen the minds of the, the very few people who've engaged in this intentionally. Because is there any, and, any uh, threat of jail at the moment for no, wage theft? Right. No, no, no. Well, sorry, in Victoria and Queensland laws exist, level. Mm. but in the, the rest of the country that's not the case. And so it needs to be shut down. But the other thing has been the fines. Now, if you take uh, a case like 7-Eleven, which is probably the most celebrated case that people were aware of. The total underpayments across a range of franchises there amounted to $173 million in underpayments. The fine that was alleged, the fine that was applied, less than $2 million. Now, mm. we don't have a situation where someone robs a bank and we say, oh, all you've got to do now is just give the money back and maybe uh, pay 1% extra on top of it. Uh, and so the big shift we're doing with the fines, yeah, there's a shift to the maximum fine, but the big thing is that the fines will now be able to be multiples of what the underpayment was. So you right. get a direct relationship between how much has been underpaid and what the courts are ultimately able to order, up to three times the amount of the underpayment. So in order to find where this is occurring, will your laws make it easier for union delegates to be able to um, enter workplaces to inspect the books? Yes, there's, there's two changes in terms of trying to get to these issues earlier. Like, one of the striking things about the big cases of wage theft that we've seen hasn't just been the quantum, it's been how many years it's gone on before we've got to it. So there's changes both for union delegates and right of entry for union officials. So what so are they? Union delegates already work in the workplace, hmm. OK? So they're people who are already employed and we've got a provision there to be able to have them trained so that they get some rights uh, to be able to represent their fellow workers and to also make sure they're trained so you've got someone in the workplace who knows what their rights are. And would that delegate in the workplace be able to then look at the payroll, see what everybody's getting paid, including non-union members? Oh, no, it doesn't give, them, doesn't give right. them that sort of access, but it allows them when issues are raised to be able to help represent people. The access for union officials uh, goes to what you've raised there, where at the moment the Fair Work Commission has the power to order that someone with a right of entry can visit a workplace without 24 hours notice, normally you have to give 24, in one particular circumstance, which is if they think there's a risk of documents being shredded, documents being destroyed, in which case giving the 24 hours notice, you know, by the time you get there what you're looking for is not there. Uh, so the Fair Work Commission already has that power. We're adding one extra ground, which is they'd also be able to do that in cases where the Commission believes there's a risk of underpayment occurring. Now the, the reason for this is sometimes in underpayment cases all the records are impeccable. Because, for example, people are cl clocking off and being told after you've clocked off you've got to come back and keep working. Now, the only way you get to uncover and establish that that is in fact happening is if you arrive without the notice, but that would be entirely in the hands of the Commission in granting... Okay, so they wouldn't have to suspect documents are going to be destroyed, but they would have to suspect there's some underpayment going on, and then the union official can be granted the right to hold a, a snap inspection. That's right, with whatever rules the Fair Work Commission applies. So there's some restrictions there that we're not changing. So there's already a restriction in, it's, um, I think it's section 483AA or something of the Act that deals with non-union members. Uh, so and, just clear, clear and we're not changing that at all. Okay, so would the union official be able to see what everyone's paid, including non-union members? No, no, we're not, we're not making any change 
to the rules for non-union members. Okay. No change to that at because all. Because if and a non-union member's worried that a, a, a union official is going to come in and see what they're being no, paid, no, those, those, that won't happen. And I've seen the fear, the fear campaign that we were going to change those rules. We're not changing them at all. Right. Not at all. Okay. Um, that section remains exactly as it already is. And there has also been a fear campaign about something about residential premises. There's a ban on right of entry being used for, for home businesses and residential premises. That remains completely unchanged as well. Um, will there be any exemption for small business from this or will this apply to small business as well? Look, the, the big shift for small business, what I referred to for the training of delegates, that doesn't apply to small business. And similarly, COSBOA, the small business organisation, asked for there to be a code. So even though we're limiting it to a ten intention, to have a small business code where there's just a document that's produced that says, if you follow these rules, you are guaranteed that you're OK. And so we'll be putting in the legislation that that code has to be produced as well for small business. And if they choose to follow it, it's not an extra compliance, they don't have to, but if they choose to use the code as their guide, they're guaranteed that they'll be on the right side of the ledger. Look, employers sometimes point out one of the reasons for underpayment can be the complexity of all the different award rates that they're meant to be paying different workers. Why don't you fix uh, the, um, the, the complexity of the award system, have some simplification? Is that something we can expect any time soon? Look, there's a, a review of the awards being undertaken by, by the Fair Work Commission, so, so that work's being undertaken. Uh, but I, I've got to say, when we're talking about the crime being for intentional wage theft, that's where someone knows the rules. Mm. They know exactly what they're doing. It's the cases where somebody knows that someone is meant to be paid more and they don't care because they think they can get away with it and they know that up until now, the worst they'll have to do is just pay the money back at a later point in time. So wage theft has nothing to do with complexity. Mm. I, it's I, about yeah. theft. I, I, I don't doubt that that's, uh, it is a serious problem where, it, where it's happening, but. Um, award complexity is a real thing as well and, and some particularly smaller and medium sized businesses really struggle with this. So you're saying it's entirely up to the Fair Work Commission to sort that out? Oh look, the, the Fair Work Ombudsman has been providing support and that support's increased in terms but of you're not going to for, for small business. The People often use the term complexity as a way of trying to say can we give workers fewer rights? That part of it, I'm not interested. Well, sometimes they, that they, part they, of it. No, sometimes they, they genuinely are. No, no. And if you, I just said that part. The other part of it is the review that's being undertaken by the Fair Work Commission. That's the appropriate body to do that because they're the ones that ultimately right. have to make rulings around the awards. We initiated that as part of the agreements with the Crossbench okay. last year. On the gig economy, now you want to give the Fair Work Commission the power to set some minimum standards, uh, including pay. Just explain to us how would minimum pay work for an Uber driver or delivery rider, for example? Yeah, so the, the starting point here is at the moment, if you're, the Fair Work Commission asks, are you an employee? If you're an employer, you've got a whole lot of rights. If you're not an employee, all of those rights fall off a cliff. The power that we're giving the Fair Work Commission here is to, to basically turn that cliff into a ramp. So for people in the gig economy who are considered to be employee-like, you can have some minimum standards. Not all the minimum standards that you get as an employee, but some. And rate of pay is, is probably one of the key examples. So it'd be for the Commission to work out what was the appropriate way to do it for each different form of How would of you work. envisage that working? Because well, it's reasonable to presume that you wouldn't be able to do it through an hourly rate for jobs that happen for 15 minutes or, or 10 minutes sometimes or even a briefer period of time. So it's reasonable to presume that for a delivery rider, for example, they might do something like a per five minute or per minute rate or something like that. But only when they're actually doing a delivery, they're not going to be paid when there's no work in that hour? Oh, I don't see, you couldn't possibly uh, pay someone just for being on an app. Remember, most of these delivery riders will be on two to four apps at the same time. Mm. Uh, if you're being paid just for being on the app, mm. it'd effectively break the, the technology. So a minimum, for example, five minute payment for delivering the food. That, that's the sort of concept that, I, that is how the, the right. Fair Work Commission would ultimately make if, these If decisions. they're still being paid per delivery though, that's not going to get around the problem of them racing around, taking risks to do as many jobs as they can uh, during those couple of hours they're working. There is, there is no doubt when people are ultimately receiving really low wages, then making ends meet is tougher mm. and that puts extra pressure on you to take risks. And that risk will and be there every, still. Every, every rider, every, sorry, every driver 
has seen what's happening with people running red lights, red lights with people you know, forming an extra lane between the parked cars and the traffic, knowing at any moment if a car door opens, instead of riding between the cars, you're lying along beside them. This is real. Riders have spoken to me about it. And they say quite specifically that part of the desperation is you're just not earning enough to make ends meet. Now, so apart from pay, what about minimum standards on superannuation or even um, annual leave? Uh, leave entitlements are, are harder to work out when you're working on multiple apps. It's possible the Commission could go down, you know, you could end up with systems uh, where you have portable entitlements or something like that. But super. I think anything like that would be a long what way down the super? track. What about super? Superannuation would be something they'd possibly be able to work through. That could be, um, that could be a and, significant extra and, and we, uh, at, and we, at 11%. That, well, that, that, that if could... you, look at the, you look at the rates of pay, the Victorian uh, Government a few years ago actually made an assessment of what's the difference between what these individuals would be getting as employees mm. to what they're getting now. And that inquiry came out saying it's roughly between three to four dollars an hour difference, which to us might not sound like a lot, but when you're on those base rates of pay, that's a really but, significant. But bottom line, you don't you don't really know at the moment. It'd be up to the commission to decide if if pay increases, if they then get super, if they then get some leave entitlement as well. It could be more than just the tiny bit extra that you've talked about. Well, certainly it can't be anything that interferes with the nature of the engagement. So that's why overtime wouldn't work. That's why rostering wouldn't work. Uh, but, you know, if you, you do the maths on the difference being something in the order of 3 to $4 an hour, you know that people do between four to six deliveries in an hour usually. You can do the maths pretty quickly. It makes a huge difference to them, but it's a very modest difference to someone. You know, it's a, it's a smaller difference than whether you add anchovies to your pizza. All right. What about in the care economy? Um, you've said these changes will capture um, the disability care site Mabel, uh, but not sites like Airtasker, uh, used predominantly by tradies. But some aged care and disability service providers also use Airtasker. What makes that different to Mabel? Now, no, the, the difference isn't based on the, the title. The difference is based and the test is done on the workers. And this is what I explained later on in the question time at the National Press mm, Club. But they're often the, the same week. workers using both sites. No, no, that, that's, that's what I'm saying. Right. It's, it's not that Airtasker itself has some magic exemption. It's most of what we understand to be Airtasker in terms of, of tradies, in terms of the people you'll get to fix stuff around your house. Um, I, I've often used the site myself. That sort of work wouldn't satisfy the test to be employee-like. And it's three things that you need to satisfy to be employee-like that the, the Commission will look at in working out. They'll look at whether or not you have low control over your work. They'll look at whether or not you have low bargaining power. And they'll look at whether or not you're being paid less than what you would be paid if you're an employee. So that you, does apply okay. to Just care to economy. Yeah. So if, if, so, if, yes, if they make a ruling about the care economy, would yeah. that... Apply would that apply to someone who is care economy under Airtasker? Yes, of course it would. Okay. But most of the jobs that people use Airtasker for are effectively like a tra the trading post. So you wouldn't be able to suddenly do the exact same work for a lower pay uh, and undercut by hopping under a different platform. But it is, it is a little confusing. About the work. So if, if you were booking someone on Airtasker uh, under the NDIS to do cleaning in, in your house, um, for example, gardening, that could have minimum standards applied, but if you're booking them to trim the hedges, um, that, that wouldn't attract those minimum standards? Look, if you, if you look at the test, the minimum standards where, where it's pretty clear you'd be able to be in are food delivery, uh, ride share, and the work that's being done in the care economy. But does that include those cleaning? Other, I, I, I find it hard to see that people in those sorts of businesses um, where they, you just look at the way they're structured, uh, I find it hard to believe that, that they would find they would, they would be covered here. So some of those who advertise an air task for cleaning services for aged care or disability uh, care recipients, they're, they're out. Well, the, qu the question is, do you satisfy those three? Do you satisfy do those three examples? And look, it's not impossible for the Commission to look at a situation where someone's giving cleaning services and it becomes standard across platforms that cleaning services and people are only being paid $10 an hour uh, to be able to say we need to okay, get in there. Sorry, and just to quickly, the cleaning services then in or out of this new. Uh, the issue goes approach. to whether the workers 
for minimum standards have any of those three characteristics. Now, and the cleaners? And, well, cleaners that, that most cleaning services that you'll see uh, on Airtasker particularly, or any of those uh, different platforms, pay well above, well above what they so pay if no, someone was an employer. Okay, so they're not going to be applying well, minimum you, standards? You don't need minimum standards if you're already being paid more than what the minimum would be if you're an employee. All right, so, OK. Just the, pr the problem we've got at the moment, David, and let's just get back to the actual problem oh, we're trying, trying no, to I'm solve. I'm trying to get to a specific uh, answer here for a cleaner who's on the Mabel platform or the Airtasker platform, they're fine. They're not going to have these minimum standards applied. The test is, are they being paid less there than they get if they're an employee? And right. if they're being paid less than what Australia has already decided are the minimum standards we need to have, then the Fair Work Commission would have the power to be able to say, we're going to put some minimum standards here too. We don't want to become a nation where you have to rely on tips to make ends okay. meet. And that's where... For all of these different examples you can give, you go through them and simply ask, if someone was an employee, there would be minimum standards. Is this something on top of that or is it seriously undercutting it? And if it's undercutting it, we need to act because Australia should be a nation where minimum standards right, apply. Just quickly, uh, a couple of things. The right to disconnect. Um, some unions have, have talked about this, the right to turn off your phone and not answer calls and emails from work once you've clocked off. You've expressed some support for this over the over the uh, recent months. Is that going to be in the bill or not? No, it won't. Okay. It won't be in the bill. Con conceptually, I'm I'm interested in it. Obviously, an employer needs to be able to call if they're looking for somebody. Right. If there's a shift, someone sick, things like that. But this concept, where some people are constantly expected to be answering emails, answering questions where they're not being paid, I've got a bit okay, of sympathy. But not not in argument. this bill. Um, on the process here, we had Allegra Spender on the program last year, worried about last week, worried about how much time Parliament will have to consider this. How much time will Parliament get? We'll have full four weeks of debate in the House of Representatives before we send it to the Senate. So I'll be introducing it tomorrow. Uh, the debate will then start on the Tuesday after the parties have had their chance to have their party room processes. Uh, and right. and then the the Senate obviously it's in in their hands but we don't need to get it to the Senate until we've had our full four weeks. Okay, and just uh, finally, um, business worry this is going to hurt jobs. It's going to drive up costs. Is there any analysis that you've done around that? But the, the whole package I'm talking about. Oh, what yeah. impact there'll be on cost and jobs? Yeah. So the the full regulation impact statements attached uh, right. as a separate document at, what at the back of, at back of the bill. Look. The impact is really minor, and here's why. Positive or negative? Here's why. Really minor. There are some people who will have to pay more. Yeah, there are. But the reason it's a minor impact is all we're talking about is closing loopholes where we already have a standard. We have a standard for what people should be paid. Wage theft is when that's being undercut. Mm -hmm. We have standards in award systems for employees, but the gig economy so, okay. is undercutting that. So some the higher labour hire loophole, The labour hire loophole is where people are being paid less mm -hmm. than the enterprise agreement rate that has been agreed to. All this bill does is says when we already have standards in place, you shouldn't be able to undercut them. OK, and the impact on jobs? The impact on jobs will be positive. OK, Tony Burke, thank you for joining us. Great to talk.